and go. Awesome. All right, hello everybody. Today we're joined by Susan Gardner, who is a philosophy professor at the University of Capilano in British Columbia, Canada. She's also the director of VIP for C, which is a philosophy for children group out of Vancouver. And she is the queen of the world, according to her granddaughter. <laughs> and today, I think we're just interested in the idea of truth um, in general and how that relates to coaching and our practice. Um, yeah, so anything you want to share? Any questions came up from reading her paper, guys, that are interested in, interesting to you? David, do you want to go? I'm to go. Yes, go for it, Sue. Of course. Uh, yeah. Why, uh, why would people who are involved in sport think that an understanding of truth is important? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I suppose as coaches, I suppose not just in coaching, but in so many different areas, um, we are doing things, we're making interventions all the time um, in the hope that there is some kind of uh, causality right, that comes after those uh, interventions, whatever they might look like, the words you say, the way you move, the exercises you do, anything, right? And is there some uh, causality, uh, some uh, action or behavior that, we, that, that might um, come as a result from this? And how, how are those things linked? Is there a truth that this one thing will lead to the next? And I suppose that for me is, is, is one of the most interesting things, right? The causality element of it. Um, but yeah, and, 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 and especially now, coaches with the internet are communicating now. There is, there's always been a lot of information. There's always been so many different approaches one can take right, to any, any endeavor. Um, so the idea of truth, I suppose, is a way to try to navigate through those and try to choose one over the other, right? And to try yeah. and uh, uh, make, make those kinds of choices. So I think, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a daily consideration, I would say, for, for, for me anyway, when I'm coaching. I think just to follow that quickly, I would say, if you're going to make the claim that some uh, coaching practices are better or more efficient than others, then you need to get into it and have some way of supporting that claim. And I think most people would probably agree with that claim. So then there's a question of how do you, uh, how do, you do the process of supporting that? Well, you know, there's another way you could look at it, and that is um, both of those answers suggest that um, sport is siloed, that everybody lives their lives, and then when you go into sport, you're just looking at what works in the sport. Mm -hmm. And so you could actually say that um, sport is a part of life mm -hmm. and how youngsters behave and are motivated motivated in that realm should spill over into their lives. So as coaches, it would seem to me that your view should be not just helping youngsters be good athletes, but a more primary goal would be to help them be good people. And to be a good person, you have to have the notion of truth anchored because otherwise you're going to fall into relativity. Mm -hmm. That is, you're, the kids are going to say, well, you know, it doesn't, this is my opinion, that may be your opinion. They have to know that uh, just as there are better or worse moves on the, on the sports field, there are better or worse moves in life. It's not just a matter of opinion. So I think mm -hmm. you could expand the role of what it is to be a coach, it seems to me. Yes, so I think um, that actually connects pretty closely to with part of the reason we're trying to do these conversations is we felt that people tend to disagree about coaching practices at the point where they disagree about what, what it means to play and be involved in sport. So I think that's part of our uh, reasoning behind speaking to people who are outside sport who might be able to give you know a little a little bit of a perspective where it's not right in front of their face and they've been doing it their whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think I, just for just so we're uh, just you know um, everything's clear. I I don't coach um, I coach young adults, um, so it'd be from maybe seventeen, eighteen upwards, um, generally speaking. So I, 
whether or not there's differences there and how we do it, we can, we can, and, and, and these are guys that are hopefully going to get professional contracts. So there, we, there might be differences, there might not be. It could be interesting to get to that at some point. But yeah, I thought it was interesting you were saying there, Sue, that, that um, the, the, the choices you make on the, on the football field, right, the soccer field, and then the choices you make in life, right, and generally speaking. And there's a right and wrong in, or I think that I don't want to misquote, uh, misquote you, them, but the right and wrong in both domains, right? And, or yeah, better or worse. Better or worse, sorry. That's what you said, yeah, sorry. Better or worse. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's super interesting. I, I, that's something I always think is one of the most interesting things about being a football coach is you have this, uh, this game, right? Football, which mm -hmm. is zero sum in its structure. Yes. Game, which is fine. Uh, so then there's dynamics within that that are zero sum. But like you said, like you say, it is nested within our being, right, our, uh, in the world. And the, that strikes me as not zero sum, right? The, 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 we want to be non-zero in, in that way and, and try to, uh, uh, we can have as many win-wins as possible uh, as, when we're acting in the world. So that, that, that the difference between those, because the, I think coaching is almost your time to play both games at the same time and try to be to do well at both games at both uh, uh, modalities of the game so it's like uh, <laughs> it's tricky it gets super tricky it is very tricky but that's, I wonder, yeah. that's really interesting that you say that jamie because um doesn't that suggest then that there is a real challenge um when being involved in sport because it is a liability to see life as zero sum, but as we know, unhappily, that has filtered into the way we see people, the way we see countries and so on. There are winners and losers. And uh, that may be something for all coaches to keep in mind that this is a huge liability, that you don't want to saddle those who you coach uh, with a perspective that is either you're a winner or a loser in this in this game of life and even in this game and how you would get around that is it would be a real challenge it seems to me yeah and maybe to play i don't know if this is playing devil's advocate maybe it is but we'll do it and, and say the other way too, right because when you're when you're coaching football in the zero sum dynamic it would be a mistake to play that as non-zero entirely because there is a zero sumness to it and there are better or worse actions uh, we could, in terms of, you might say, some kind of, there are certain coach uh, uh, methodologies that would say there is an objectively correct way to do this, you know, in terms of the zero sum dynamics and how far you get drawn into just using that framework it mm -hmm. is, is, yeah, is dependent, obviously, on where you are. Uh, on your environment, but there's definitely an element of zero sumness. I think you have to be aware of as well in 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 in, in that respect. So the, the what do you think about the emotional uh, offload when, for example, a team loses a game? Um, because that's going to uh, color the way youngsters and young adults uh, tackle life. Um, and that is, can they still put everything into it, even if they're not considered the winners in life or the winners in sport? I mean, can they? And isn't that part of the problem there? You get the, the, the die off of, of youngsters from sport when they're not professional, because what, what's the point then? I'm not going to be a winner. So there's no point. Yeah, yeah I think it's right. you have to be careful with this kind of thing. Um, and like I say, I don't coach younger kids so much. I have coached younger kids, so I haven't got huge experience in that area. But yeah, as when you're coaching, I imagine when you're coaching younger kids, yeah, you need to be very, very super careful with this. But one of the examples I use, I suppose, is that some people say, oh, winning isn't important and this kind of thing. And I totally get that, right? What's good, like, I think it's a reasonable thing to say. But at the same time, you know, when we play, if, a, if to take it to the like the extreme side, sometimes it's quite fun to do and say, well, if a player is just uh, kicking the ball into their own goal, you might say, oh, stop, but because it's not actually that because winning is actually important, right? And it, because otherwise there wouldn't be a reason to intervene there, right? Uh, so it, you can right. kind of take it to that extreme and say, yeah, look, we want to try and help you become better at the game, but yeah, we also want to 
uh, we don't want to, you know, the worst thing would be for you to stop playing football. So, yeah, this, uh, it's just a, it's a balance, right? And I just want, I think it's completely envir environment dependent where that, where, yeah. you know, how you approach well, that balance. So isn't it, though, it's, it's, it sounds very similar to what Immanuel Kant called a regulative ideal. Uh, and that is, look, uh, there, there's no such thing as having a perfectly clean shirt. That doesn't mean that there are cleaner and dirt, clean and dirty shirts. There's no, there's nothing perfect. So yes, winning is a regulative ideal, and that's why you know if you're playing chess or you're playing hockey or, uh, and and I think that's also true in academics. That I mean, if you're going to take on academics, you want to do as well as you can. Hmm. How do you maintain the motivation if you're not? part of the winning class is the challenge, isn't it? Sure, yeah. And I, 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 yeah, just one, I'll go. Real quick, what yeah, yeah. I'm thinking is an important angle also is that it looks to me, like just from my observation of watching kids, that competitive behaviors emerge. Like if you leave, you know, it, universally, it would seem if you leave young kids alone, some type of competition tends to emerge. And I think the question then is, well, what, what does that mean to them? And I think uh, I like the angle James Cars takes with Finite and Infinite Games where he says, kids are able to play games that have a competitive element, but that it has a continual, some something about it carries on as opposed to playing with the attempt to end the game, like almost to kill the game off and become the the final winner at the end. So some I don't know if there's maybe at some point where that becomes lost because it seems natural to me that before a certain point it's not an opposition and that kids are able to naturally compete in a way that sustains the competition itself. That's hugely insightful it seems to me David and that is that um then you're not going to get the emotional downer. Okay, so you won this one. Wait till I get you the next time. And mm -hmm. so there isn't that uh, you know, zero sum. You know, I'm the winner, you're the loser. Mm -hmm. Only this time, but next mm -hmm. time, just you wait. And I think that will maintain the relationship between winners and losers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in a way that it's 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 more like a dance. We're mm -hmm. dancing this together. So this time I had the better step. You'll have the better step next time. And so winners will not perceive themselves as better. Losers will not perceive themselves as worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's important because um, it, it it seems that competition is in innate and important. Mm -hmm. You know, we do do better when we uh, have a goal. Alex, you were going to say something? Well, this reminds me then. Yeah, this reminds me a lot of like, so maybe it's the culture or society or adults who muck everything up for kids uh, in some to some extent, um, because maybe we place too much emphasis on the result or one single game because yeah, I agree with you, David, like you say, the children just allow it to carry over. Um, so how yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Maybe it's us that that are screwing everything up or culture or uh, well, I think hearing Sue talk, one question I thought might, I don't know if this is the answer to that, but is there a point where we realize that there's an ultimate end to the game and that that ultimate roles will be assigned? Because maybe before a certain point, we don't imagine that the game will end. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so is there a way that that can be altered in some way? Um, but I, I really like what you're saying though, David, I, it reminds me of, so now that we have lockdown and I'm doing geography with my six year old, so we have, we do hangman and, uh, you know, she's got to guess what the country is, whether it's Nigeria or Honduras or whatever. And she just thinks it's fabulous. I'm going to get you next time, Nana. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get a three letter word for you now. <laughs> So, I mean, it's all huge, and she loves that, but it, so the competition makes learning geography fun. 
Mm-hmm. She doesn't have to sit in front of a globe and say, oh, there's Nigeria, there's Honduras. Do you think mm-hmm. it has to do with like this aeonic time, like this, like it's it's playful, so it seems like it's aeonic, and that might allow for this continuation, as opposed to something chronological where you say, well, that's the end of the game, and you're the loser, and now there's nothing. It's it's not flowing in the same way that you would just play again, for example. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that's probably a big part of it because I think that's a big part of what I still get out of playing sport is when I'm really into it, you forget that the game is going to end. And I don't know if there's that many other domains that maybe, I mean, if you get lost in a really good conversation, it could be a similar thing where you forget it's going to end. Um, but I I don't know. It seems like there's, for me, that's always been a, a portal to kind of return to return to that ionic time. Mm-hmm. Or is it, though, um, so, for example, if you're an academic, Mm-hmm. Uh, there, while there is, it's true, there is competition, there's a way in which, um, it seems to me, because you keep learning all of the time, all of the time, there isn't ever really a winner or a loser. I mean, it's true that some people get to teach at Harvard and others don't. And so there's a sense in which that's a winner. But, um, but if you're an academic, you keep winning. And if you're in sport and you love sport and you keep doing it, then there isn't a winner or loser. Mm-hmm. Um, and is that part of the problem of sport? And that is either you get into the big leagues or that's the end of it. And that's yeah, I'm, you- I'm actually curious, Jamie, what you would do, like how, how do your players deal with that if they don't get a professional contract? And what is your relationship or, res- or role or maybe even responsibility to those players who don't get a professional contract? Yeah, sure. But it's, it's, yeah, uh, if a player's, it depends on the player, right? It really does. Uh, all, 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 all people are different and some uh, would be affected differently by, by, the, you know, by not getting a professional contract, for example. Um, and as a Again, the relationship, responsibility. You hope that you want you want them to keep playing football, right? You want them to keep playing football and keep loving the game, uh, and be successful as a person in whatever they choose to do in their relationships and whatever path they choose to go down. And I think one of the interesting things is that while we're talking about this idea of the of the winning and the losing, it might just be that, and maybe because football is a team game, might be. I'm not so sure, much sure about individual sports. Maybe it is the case, but. I think that one of the one of the best ways of of playing well in football is to practice these things that we talk about in uh, about being good practice in real life in, in in life about helping each other right about understanding each other about uh, putting oneself in another person's shoes about empathy right and and all these ideas I think the ability for a team to do that actually helps them win right. Mm-hmm. Which is quite, which is quite cool. In fact, so so this idea of of of, of living uh, in a way that you would want to live, if you practice this in this group and this and this this your squad member of how many however many players you are, it seems to be that that will actually enhance your effectiveness at putting the ball in the back of the net in in the cold, hard facts of the game. So there's a connect there, I think, which is really interesting, and. I think some of the ways that, that that people come together in groups outside of football, whether it's well, there's, there's any number of ways that people cohere in groups and become familiar in, in ways uh, with each other. I think that we could, that, that it's an interesting area to look at those aspects and try and see that how can we have put them into football that that community that community that that that, that communal understanding um, can be very useful. In, in, in football. So if, if your teaching is reflect, hopefully trying to get that across, and hopefully that bodes well outside of football as well, uh, while also being effective football coaching in, in the in the in maybe the more uh, zero sum sense, if that if that if that tracks what I'm saying there. I don't know. Is there any? Uh, has there ever been a suggestion that sports teams should also have some kind of uh, community responsibility or outreach that if you're going to be on this team, you have to do X number of volunteers with the team in, 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 you know, lower income neighborhoods and so on, so that you could actually walk the talk because, you know, when you say in football, you know, you have to be empathetic. Well, 
not you're not really being empathetic if you're really just you know trying to figure out what the what your fellow player or your opponent's doing. I mean, has there ever been well, something that that's outside of the sport that's anybody? Yeah, seen? I know the team that I played on, like in college, university, uh, we were required to do a lot of volunteer work. You know, as a whole team. Really? Which I think, yeah, I I actually felt like that was a different experience than doing it as an individual. Um, and I did feel like it added somehow to the meaning of both the volunteering and the team. So, yeah, I, I think a lot of teams do. Definitely not all. The, the, the empathy ones, are, maybe we have a different understanding like, of what I always think of empathy as being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and see and see why they would see, see the world from from their perspective. That, that to me is what empathy is. Be. Well, no. it, it, that's a that's a good question, I, uh, Jamie. It seems it, there are many uh, definitions. It seems to me, but uh, empathy. I mean, after all, um, a psychopath is probably the most empathetic of all people because right. he he or she is able to put emotions aside and really try and figure out how what would really hurt you. Mm -hmm. So right. you could count empathy that way, and that is yeah, I yeah. can put myself in your shoes and know yeah. what would really hurt you. Yeah. A lot of people use empathy to imply that somehow or other I would identify with you and so try to ease your pain. Yeah, it can go so both ways, right? It's, yes. That's the, yeah. that's the thing about it. Yeah. So I think when empathy is, yeah, I think if, if we're looking at that way as well, like if I'm, uh, can I have a relationship with a teammate that I know that I, I almost know what they're thinking, that I know where they're going to pass, I can, I can, I can understand what their what, what their thought process is going to be and then be, become this very tight cohesive you're like a band jamming or something you yes, know, you but don't have to, you know. in that case you could bring up a team of sociopaths I'm sure yeah you could right but, yeah. but also, I mean, they, also they know exactly what you're thinking you're yeah. you know i'm a good salesperson or you know i'm a head of a corporation and i know exactly what's going to make you buy stuff that's going to ruin the planet and totally bankrupt yeah. you but no, i know it can be, or you. it can be yeah it can be used for uh, different purposes right which is a uh, which is problematic <laughs> right. yeah that, so there sure. should, should there not be then a significant effort to try and uh and then perhaps the, what we use should use the word sympathy and that is to try and in, increase the sympathy of those who have for those who have not so now we're back again to winners and losers right mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's, that would be a different. Uh, yeah, that would be another another yeah. another aspect for sure. I know Bielsa didn't. Bielsa force his players to clean the stadium so that they could feel what the workers who clean the stadium feel like, uh, or or something along those lines. I know he's done things like that. Possibly. I, mean, I, I know Guardiola think... has talked about on uh, press interviews like people say, "Oh, you know, you lost the game," and he's like, "Well, it's way more complex than that." And so yeah, I know he's talked also about just the nature of winning. Versus like the complexity of everything that goes on. Good. But I, I just was curious. Maybe we could uh, change the conversation a little bit, switch gears mm -hmm. a little bit, because your article on truth had me thinking a lot about well things that we've talked about in the past related to soccer coaching. But nowadays we're in a lot. We're in a. It seems to me like there's a lot of these dualisms that create polarities or either ors. And so I'm just curious how you would deal with statements like this method is the the only method in how you would train your players uh, and if they claim to have truth and how you would deal with that from the perspective of capital T truth um, well that's an interesting question um, that would be if, if I took it to my uh, I took it into my realm it would be like somebody saying um, there's only one way to teach philosophy which is ludicrous uh, it's I think anybody who's in education, I'm sure all of you found this as well, that it seems to me that education is all about the relationship between the educator and those uh, that he or she is trying to reach out to. And that's all about what's in that relationship. So how I teach would be completely different from how somebody else teaches. So my goal in teaching is to reach across that divide and so that the the people that I teach feel that I am really there for them. I want to be the wind beneath their wings. Uh, and I think there are many ways to be that wind. So I would never, uh, for example, Alex, you and I at, 
as you know, we've all, all of us talked about in the field of philosophy for children, there's no one way to facilitate a community of inquiry because to, to do that well, you have to bring yourself to the table. And I'm completely different from many others. I'm, I tend to be in teaching quite an extrovert. Somebody might be an introvert and do it so, so differently. So I think there can't possibly be the best way to teach. There can for sure though, be ways not to do it. And so that sort of comes up with what Jamie said earlier. If you're teaching your players to kick the ball into their own net, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> so we must but I play. also think that um, you, uh, in, in academia, for example, if you're not inspiring youngsters to learn the material, that's a failure. So I think if you go back to this notion of moving towards truth as a function of falsification, you know for sure that there are some methods that don't work. And so one ought not to uh, be worried about saying, I think that that method is faulty. But I, I would be very reticent to say this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. So the question I have is, let's say um, you know, you're know you some type of a teacher and Alex is some type of a teacher and you you have different outcomes, which I suppose could be thought of along different um, metrics or, but if, if we have some type of a judgment that, you know, Sue had a better outcome than Alex with the students and which, you know, however you want to imagine that um, comparison. But then there's a question of, Sue says, well, the reason why my outcome is better is because I always wear a blue sweater when I teach. Um, so that's essentially, I think, part of what we're dealing with, right, is claims that have to do with causality of outcomes where maybe the whole context isn't, you know, have, have Sue's students been selected prior as, you know, having different characteristics, whatever, that there's so many different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, for us, where a lot of the notion of truth... Well, I think you want to turn it on its head again because you're notion of causality was positive again, and that is that this happened because of. So that's the verification theory of truth. Mm -hmm. So what you want to say is, why, why did this not work? So if I say it didn't work because I wore a blue sweater, I'd have to have some evidence that that contributed to the downfall of this instance. I think what you're trying to get at, though, I think I hear a subtext here, that there may be some coaches that say, um, my team did better because I made them come to practice seven days a week or something like that yeah. instead of five. Okay. That's just bad science, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, well, I mean, in order to make that kind of claim, you'd have to have a control group, you'd have, you know, an experimental group, you'd have to have players that were all at the same level, you'd have to give them and so on, so that the only the only independent variable was the way that was coaching. So I think that it's just bad science. Mm -hmm. On what basis would you, you know, I mean, I, my cold, I had three martinis last night and my cold's gone. It must be the three martinis. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's everybody drink. I mean, just, and that's just bad science. So the question is if, if a claim has if it implies a type of causality, like so if, uh, if I'm 100 years old and I say the reason I've lived to 100 years old is because I um, eat a certain type of cheese. Well, there's an implication, I think, that the reason of me being 100 years old could be broken into some type of atomic units that exert um, proportional efficient causes on that outcome. But if you're dealing with human development, I think people will point out, well, that's not the case. But then the question is, how do you maintain, like you said, how, or how do you stay out of relativity, given that you might not have that type of efficient cause? You stay out of relativity because you know what doesn't work. You you really know what doesn't work. So in 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 reasoning, you're going to go after the reasons. Is that a good reason or a bad reason? In in uh, um, 
in science, you're going to go after the evidence. Is that really good evidence for this claim? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that in life, you're going, you've, we've got to flip it and say, look, we're interested in why something doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, go after that. What is it? Did the, did the coach, and when you say, of course, it doesn't work, what do we mean by that? And I think you were uh, attesting to that, David. I mean, it may be that my students may not get straight A's, but maybe they have a passion for philosophy and they keep reading it for the rest of their lives. So, uh, whereas somebody who requires them to rote learn might do better on the quizzes. Mm -hmm. So, um, why, why, I guess my question is, why do we want to answer this question? Is mm -hmm. it because you're trying to cull the various coaches? Or are you trying to find a better or worse regulative idea for coaching? Or why are Jamie, we asking? this might, might be a good one for you with the idea yeah. about narrative. Yeah. Oh, well, I was just listening to that, that where you guys were talking about there. And, and, and yeah, it's one of the problems it seems to be in, in football is that in football coaching is that it's very difficult to know what doesn't work. I, and, yeah. and it's very difficult because someone might say, you could, I uh, would say, okay, here's this style of training, which is more individual based, say unopposed drill based. And that doesn't work because X, Y, Z testing that we did over here. Right. And you go, okay. Fine. And then someone else says, yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, it's not clear cut. It's not like a, you're not in a vacuum, right? You're using, you're in the complexity of the world in a culture with human beings. And it seems to be that lots of different approaches can, can be effective football coaching in different ways at the same time. And it seems difficult to be able to pinpoint, obviously some, we can, like there's extreme examples. Yeah, if you, if you say clearly not good coaching, but sometimes someone, a coach might want to take someone for a, a team for a walk through the woods. Yeah. Sometimes it might be shooting practice without a goalkeeper. Sometimes it'd be with a goalkeeper. Sometimes it would be t uh, mini games against each other. And it seems very difficult to try to say, well, that doesn't work, right? To, okay, to falsify something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what does yeah. work mean? Yeah, this you think that doesn't right. work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is super interesting. So if, if coaches are saying, now we're back, say, in academia, if it's yeah. how many A's you get, sure. then I'm not your coach. Okay. I mean, yeah. I'm not interested yeah. in how yeah. many A's okay. my students yeah. get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So work, work. I mean, yeah, we could, it's not easy just to pinpoint and say exactly what it is, but I don't think it's as simple as just winning the games, right, and, and, and putting points on the board. It's something like maybe if I'm a coach and I'm watching my team play, it's something like, uh, development of, of 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 play in some way and and different coaches have uh, and there's different ways of playing football as well there's different approaches one can take and again uh, and this isn't something that I would, maybe is relative to such younger children again but yeah e there's different criteria depending on the environment you're in for what works right but i think there has to be some kind of criteria for what works otherwise why go in any that why go yeah. in one direction more than the other right um so, David, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think it's why I feel it's a relevant question is because um, in the absence of, you know, other metrics or thoughts about what works, it's always convenient that there's a, you know, the zero sum score that's always there. And I think a lot of people, they, they run from that in a sort of a reactive way that ends up just bringing them back around to you know they don't get anywhere and then people say well uh, you know you've claimed that you're going to end up here and there but look at the 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 score line essentially mm -hmm. so we're sort of back to the beginning again aren't we because it's it's as if <laughs> we need winners that look if all of my class fails then clearly my approach is is faulty mm -hmm. right uh, but if all of my class gets straight a's that's not a testament to good teaching Mm -hmm. Right. That's a mm -hmm. testament that I have trained people to write the test. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's and the difficulty is that the art of sport and the art of living is an art. Mm -hmm. And you're not ever going to be able to have definitive criteria. Mm -hmm. And right. that's where it would seem to me that you're going to have different coaches who are going to say, my my view is I want my youngsters to adore the sport. Yep. If they're good, wonderful. 
-hmm. If they're not fabulous, I still want them to adore the sport and I want it to spill over into life. There are going to be others who say, look, I am a very competitive person and I only want to train those who are going to be professional and excellent at it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that we, we need to have one kind of coach or one kind of academic. Absolutely. We can have very many. And th I think mm -hmm. for each of us, we just need to be prepared to walk the talk. That each yeah. of us has to have a talk with ourselves and say, this is the kind of coach I want to be. This is, this is my, my gift to the world, given my talent, my genes, the luck of the draw. And I'm prepared to stand up and be yeah. counted for this. Now, if yeah. you want your kids to be coached in that manner, I'm your person. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I love that. So like that seems to be that seems authenticity, right? Is what we're talking about there. And like that, that I think that's. I, I'm always sort of ringing this bell, saying like, like yeah, we, that's what we want. We, I don't, I don't like the idea of this one size fits all. And it gets very difficult in in, in, co in football coaching with coach education programs because you have to you have to have a curriculum. They have to teach you. Oh, this is how you coach. This is how you get your UEFA A license. This is what you need to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so on. And each countries have to do it. But I think yeah, I think what you, I agree entirely. It's the authenticity, right? It's it's how do I want to go about this? Yeah. And and what and, and, and I think that's super important. And and then yeah, so the, the, I'm always questioning the people that have these one size fits all buy my book become the perfect coach right because uh, this is <sighs> but isn't that is... not a relativistic outcome because we're left with no way of comparing yeah. yes you are you are prepared to say that didn't work okay so if i am a teacher and all of my students fail i am mm -hmm. not a teacher mm -hmm. But if I, so all we're saying is that there are different outcomes. So if you're, if you take coach, if you take students and all they really want to do is to get off the soccer field and, all, and watch their screens, mm -hmm. uh, then you failed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you hit, have hit, to be able to, <laughs> sorry? Or if you hit somebody, it's probably or not you hit somebody. coaching practice. I mean, you have to articulate your own criteria. Mm-hmm. Well, let, let's ask a little bit more of a narrow question then and maybe focus it a bit more because there's like this consistent uh, argument probably within academia, but definitely in, in social media circles and coaching where you say, okay, we want to develop skill in people. So we're not focused necessarily on zero sum or we're not focused necessarily on the development of the person because, yeah, those would determine different metrics and then you could justify almost an infinite number of training examples to fit whatever you're trying to develop. But let's just take skill acquisition. So the ability for a person to move their body or the ability for a person to understand things on the pitch, let's say. There's one camp who would argue that it's cognitive and that you have to have a structure. And then within that structure, you can be creative. And th this is very general. And then another camp might say, okay, let's allow for the self-emergence from these people who engage with this, you know, different constraints, varying constraints. And so there is this dualism that's created. And, and at least in my experience, these people have a difficult time talking to each other. So I'm curious, like with the understanding of truth and there being better or worse, how do you as a coach navigate all these different ideas? And, and maybe it goes back to what you were saying, Jamie, about being authentic and being yourself in relation to these different ideas. Yeah, it, it probably Sorry, does exactly do that. I mean, there are ways of teaching, for example, that I can't do. I can't teach rote. I, it, I, I find if I'm bored, I can't teach. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there are going to be some coaches that are going to be better at teaching in some ways than in others. Uh, but I, I, I think that, that David brings up an important point, and that is you've got to be very, very careful that this doesn't, fall into anything goes so going back to my field david in in philosophy for children one of the things that we have there's a there's a community of inquiry so we have we engage youngsters in talking with one another around a certain question mm -hmm. you know, that was was frog and toad we're frog and toad cowards because they ran away from the loud noise or something so they're engaged in trying to figure out what courage and cowardice is. 
And mm -hmm. the point is that the youngsters have to be able to give their reasons and to be able to listen to opposing points of view. And mm -hmm. so in that way, they develop cognitive flexibility. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is when we are teaching teachers to engage youngsters this way, it's hard to, to train them to be able to hear when a reason is a good reason and when a reason is a bad reason and so on. So you end up often mm -hmm. with teachers just doing opinion gathering. Mm -hmm. You think that, you think that, you think that. And there's no more difference in a community of inquiry that's facilitated like that than a, than a discussion on, in the playground. Mm -hmm. And that's a danger. That really is a danger. So I think that you have your right to say we have to be aware that there are some ways of doing coaching and teaching that are not allowing for development. Mm -hmm. And so we're always going to be having to look for measures of development. So here's a question, given that uh, specific example, how, so you have one side where you're just like you said, opinion gathering, but then on the other side, maybe the teacher's just coming down from the top saying, well, no, actually, that's not good. That is, you know, and you get that also commonly where the kids are just trying to guess, you know, what's the uh, the acceptable answer in the mind right. of the teacher. So how, how do you foster the development maybe of a consensus among those students who are conversing? Okay, so... In the community of inquiry, the goal is not consensus. Uh -huh. The goal is to ensure that youngsters recognize, or anybody, I shouldn't just say youngsters, because I use the community of inquiry at university level, young adults like, like um, um, Jamie does. Um, uh, it's, it's the goal of anyone to make sure you, you, you need to have a good reason. And if you don't give me a good reason, reasons are open to falsification. So uh, if you don't give a good reason, then the facilitator, if it's a good facilitator, would say, okay, now this person just said it was okay for Frog and Toad to do that because that's what they wanted to do. Is that a good reason? So they would stop it and make sure, whoa, maybe that's not such a good reason. And then they're open to actually hearing other youngsters say, no, it's not such a good reason without taking offense. Mm -hmm. So you're so also training them how to falsify other arguments, essentially. And their own. Oh, and and their own. own. Yes, that's right. And, so, and I think this goes back to one of the things that you've taught in the past, Sue, which is that it's not actually thinking unless you're going, you're doing this. And so if you, if you go back to the comment I made earlier, well, we have people in this camp and this camp and nobody's doing this. So there's no thinking going on. That's right. So thinking one of the, what um, Alex is doing his finger across, what he's talking about is we describe it as trapezing, mm -hmm. that you trapeze from one side to the other. So you need to be able to say, okay, this is my, this is what I believe. And then somebody disagrees with you. Now, you, you know how difficult that is, isn't it? We all have that because you go, ah, ah. You know, and so you, most of us are polite enough to shut up until the other person stops. And then we say, yes, but. Mm -hmm. So we didn't actually listen. So a gift to youngsters in a community of inquiry is to actually listen. Mm -hmm. And so a facilitator might say to Johnny, okay, so Johnny, you saw that Jill disagreed with you. Did you hear what she said? What do you think about what she said? That's very hard to do, to stay open mm -hmm. to an opposition. It's a mm -hmm. gift if you can give that to, to youngsters to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's, so all, you're never going to get to the top of the mountain, whatever, wh whether you're a coach or you're an educator, you're always, always trying to think of better ways to do it. So I think it goes back to what Jamie is talking about, authenticity. I mean, I've been at this for way more, probably all your combined ages. Mm -hmm. and I will leave a classroom and I will think, oh, I missed that opportunity. Damn. And then I'll go back to the class the next day and say, you know what? We were talking about this. And this 
is something that we need to explore a little further. Is, mm -hmm. um, when it, it's just so fascinating when you're talking about this. So you have this you have a group of people with the difference of the opinion and it's the explanation, right, which is a very key aspect of this. And then I start thinking about, OK, we've talked about sort of coaches doing authenticity, right, and, and doing things how you, your opinion, or this is my way. Uh, and if someone said, well, ex Jamie, explain your way. Why do you uh, like want to do it this way? Or even, so, you know, why do I like this kind of music? Why do I like this kind of food? Right. My explanation might actually just be, well, oh, it's my taste. Uh, it, it, it does it for me. Right. Uh, it just it's it's not something I'm going to necessarily have a kind of logical uh, rationale for. It's, it's something that just I feel uh, passionate about. Right. It's, it's something maybe more like that, which then gets into difficult territory. Right. If you're trying to use if you're trying to evaluate explanation, this question of taste. Um, uh, and that seems to be important for authenticity, though, right? Uh, so I, I don't know that we get into no, some I, I murky think, waters. I think you got to be careful there. Okay. Right? When you're talking about taste, that you're not. This is not something for which there is a reason. So if I like chocolate ice cream and you like vanilla ice cream, yeah. there's no reason for that. It just happens yeah. to be the case that my taste buds react. Yeah. So, so, but, but there is, but there's there's a difference if I say. I think that we, uh, everybody ought to stay in place during COVID-19. And that I think it's wrong for people to go out in COVID-19. Now I need to give you reasons. Yeah, yeah, right. And Absolutely. then you may disagree and say, look, ultimately, if we, if we, if we don't get out, people are going to go absolutely bonkers. Yeah. And so the kind of mental fallout that we're going to have is maybe even worse than COVID-19. And so we go. And so I listen to you and you listen to me. Yeah. And so we may, yeah, definitely. we may not have a consensus. Hopefully, though, I have visited how you see the world. Mm -hmm. And I would be able to take that back into my world and I would be changed as a result of that. So instead of being absolutely irate at seeing television um, snippets of, of people being out, I'd say, okay, you know what? After talking with Jamie, I get it. I get it. I, I, I really think that the reasons to stay in are stronger than the reasons to go out, but I actually do get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's definitely different, uh, there's different uh, domains, right, of inquiry. So some are going to be far more, uh, the explanation is absolutely key and yeah, in, in other aspects. Yeah, like you say, if it's ice cream, sometimes, sometimes like when people talk about football and someone says, oh, I like this style of play more. Uh, well, I actually prefer this style. Sometimes I think it is just ice cream, right? And it's yeah, like, uh, right. you know, <laughs> and it's like, well, depends, doesn't it, uh, on, on, on who you are. On, on, and I, but I think that's a good thing, right? I like the fact that there's that, that multiplicity, right, of, 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 of ideas. But yeah, absolutely. There's definitely going to be part. Of that. There's definitely going to be domains where a more logical rationale. So, so maybe that's what you all should have. You should have vanilla coaches, chocolate coaches, <laughs> Neapolitan <Right>. coaches. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that. I like the idea about uh, uh, this kind of more. Yeah, the, this, yeah, the multiplicity. I think is a good is a good yeah. way of thinking about it for sure. I wonder. I wonder if there's something here between like analytics, uh, because maybe now you have like a more analytic driven. Uh, way of looking at sport and that might inform your decision making in terms of reasons so for example this style of play might be better because you know if we get the ball in this area of the field more we have a higher chance of winning you know if that's your goal so I'm curious like the relationship between something like intuition from a coach's perspective and then analytics and intuition seems to be more built on something like taste maybe and then analytics seems to be built on more like something like reason or science so there seems to be a weird interplay between those two things also. Yeah, I think for sure. I think for all of us, there is a kind of an intuition, um, subliminal learning and so on. We wouldn't be able to explain why. Uh, but then that would make you the, a chocolate ice cream coach as opposed to vinegar. <laughs> right. For me, this is part of the value of sport in development is you could almost make a parallel to that kind of a discussion that you're having in the community of inquiry, maybe where, you know, you're saying to one child or one group of children, okay, we're trying to do this. And 
you know, the opposition is, you know, trying to oppose you and do a reciprocal um, opposite thing. So then, you know, there is almost a kind of an argumentation. And I think how this guy James Karst puts it, I don't know if you would agree with this, but he says, we're, uh, I might misquote it slightly, but he says, we're strong in play, not because we can do what we want, but because we can allow the opponent to do what they want. So you've almost absorbed, you you have a flexibility, you know, to maybe attain an outcome given the a- different actions of an opponent. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I think Frog and Toad were cowards because, and if that's a good argument, then it can sustain different oppositions coming from from somebody else who you're in discussion with. Is that a fair parallel or no? I don't know. I think that's really, really interesting. Um, I I think that's fascinating. When I think when I when a community of inquiry is really growing well, it seems to me it's more like a dance mm-hmm. uh, rather than a debate. Mm-hmm. Uh, that they listen to an opposition and they think, yeah, well, that's a good point. And then they, and then there's a kind of a creative momentum that if you take one side and another side, well, then maybe this is really the answer, and and maybe this is a better way to describe it. And so maybe, um, I, I, almost what you're suggesting, David, is that there could be a a different mindset of people on the you know, in sport, that they could mm-hmm. see it more as a dance as opposed to me against you mm-hmm. uh, and and but, sort of and, and evolve their way of playing in relation to the steps that are taken to the opposition and so on. I think the <clears throat> maybe the similarity how I see it is like, so if, if you have two children on a playground, even just playing tag, um, and you, you want to look at the causality of their or their intentionality, they have to have some recognition. Well, what I do depends on what you do, but you, what you do depends on what I do. And I think there's something about that that has a similarity to what I say depends on what you say, but what you say depends yeah. on what I say. Yes. And that would be a very important um, attitude that coaches could pass on to their youngsters and that is that you grow as a function of what others do so if you lose this is not a lose this this isn't a loss you Mm -hmm. have grown Mm -hmm. so i i know for sure as being an academic and being in a community of inquiry we're really excited when we really get strong opposition going Mm -hmm. because it's it's entire the dance is entirely different Mm -hmm. Uh, and and so in fact it we it's so important that we always go into a community of inquiry with an opposition ready just in case. Yeah. And so yeah, I think that's really lovely. Yeah, the I, national team guy uh, in Canada, he just introduced this idea of collaboration as opposed to war, and it comes from some academic paper he referenced. But yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it because Federer even said that about Nadal. I'm not at my best until you're at your best. And there's some yeah. reciprocal relationship there. Yes. And if that could be emphasized so that instead of being really sad when they lose, they should be really excited because, wow, you, that, you know, they really um, brought the best out in you because it, you, this was your very strongest opposition. Mm-hmm. For me, I think where that starts to break down is the point when kids start to realize there's an ultimate end and that final titles will be assigned. Final titles. I mean, at a ultimate level, eventually you're going to die, and your life will be assigned some some type of meaning. Okay. Well, I mean, that's an existential question. Yeah, but and I that think... goes back to what I think that goes back to what Jamie said, and that is, and what we were saying before. Ultimately, every step you take, you have to be prepared to defend who it is that you are and what it is that you're doing. And that's what's going to end up being different coaches, different educators, different human beings. And we wreck it. I mean, you know, there are many flowers in the garden. I mean, I may be a terrific iris and you're a rose and, and I don't know, Alex, are you going to be a Dan <laughs> God? <laughs> what's the, what are the weeds in the garden? What are those? That's what I'll, I'll do. Let's, there you go. <laughs> 
But I so think, I think we have oh, to ahead, recognize yeah. that there isn't. I mean, it's it's just as the, the our our natural world is healthier by diversity, so is the human world, and so is every sub pocket of the human world. Mm -hmm. So, but ultimately, we really do have to. If you know, that's the existential message, isn't it, from Sartre and Camus mm -hmm. and so on, and that is that. You should always be imagining that tomorrow is your last day. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to say as you approach your maker, I did the damn best I could. Mm -hmm. That's the best so we can do. I guess the flip side of that is to say, it seems to me that people ha have something also valuable to be gained for having the perspective of almost losing sight of the end, of being in in a, maybe we want to say ionic time, or, you know, we're in a dance that we don't know is going to end and have a final judgment placed on it. Because there's something liberating about that that I tend to notice in kids' play. You know, if you see kids playing on the playground, they're not thinking there's going to be, a, you know, a clock that's going to end, and then we're going to be judged to have had these roles within that game. Well, that's tricky. Uh, of course, uh, existentials would say that's bad faith, mm -hmm. um, and I, I question whether or not that's true. So, uh, if somebody is playing on a, and and takes a rock and smacks it on some, on their friend's head, well, mm -hmm. you know, what what's, why not? There's no, but but if it is the case that youngsters are told from the get go. Who you are depends upon what you do. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a better message to youngsters. What you do on the playground is going to define who you are. And mm -hmm. who you are is going to follow you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a heavy, me I, I know it's a heavy message. And I know that there is some um, worry that you don't want to terrify youngsters. Mm -hmm. uh, but for all of us who have been through, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I personally don't know anyone who hasn't had a very challenging life. And life is a challenge. And mm -hmm. I, I had a lot of challenges when I was young and I, I wish now that I had had the direction that I think youngsters should have from the get go. Mm -hmm. And that is who you are right now at three years old is going to define, is going to begin to define who you are. So you mm -hmm. have to take responsibility for what you do. So if you whack your sister, the problem is not just that your sister is hurt. The problem is it defines you as an uncaring little girl. So mm -hmm. if you don't want to be uncaring, you don't whack your sister. So I mm -hmm. would suggest, I, I recognize it's a kind of a, a contradiction to what we said earlier in terms of time. Mm -hmm. But just think that we've got all of the time ahead of us to try and figure out how to, to get through that contradiction. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> yeah. So I think so on one side, because what I'm thinking of is this, like, let's say you have a kid who's in first grade. You could say to them, well, at the end of your life, you either will have earned such and such degree and such and such position and so now you need to go into first grade with the knowledge that someday you will look back, you know, and like you said, but I don't know, is that always an optimal mindset? Well, I guess you, you said getting first grade. So that worries me because it's defined, it's, you're defining it in terms of external rewards. Mm -hmm. It's then we're back into who's got the prettiest dress and who looks the prettiest and all the rest of st stuff. And that's not an existential calibrator mm -hmm. it's always on the inside it's what you can define um i think for sure you can say to youngsters when they're young there's seven billion people of us in the world everybody's looking for a job mm -hmm. you got to take grade one seriously mm -hmm. um i do mm -hmm. i do that with my with my um granddaughter I mean, if I hadn't had my education, life would have been 
seriously diminished as a function mm -hmm. of what the challenges that I faced. And because it's simply one, that's mine. You can't take that away from me. You can take, you can take my parents, you can take my wealth, you can take, but you can't take my education away from me. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're educating youngsters, they ought to know that the reason they're doing that is not so that because they can get into Harvard or they're going to get this or that degree. It's going to be part of what's going to make them resilient youngsters. And I think sport does the same thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe resilience is what it's all about, right, Alex? Yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> Resilience, grit, I don't know what other buzzword we want to use for it, but yeah, yeah, something to help them. And it could be, and I think this applies also not not just to youngsters, but uh, maybe to your experience too, Jamie, and maybe even to top professional coaches who work with adults. You know, you're also trying to help them become better people, even at that level. But of course, there's more pressure from... Yeah, there's a, I don't know if you, there's a great book, um, Soccer and Sun and Shadow, Eduardo Galeano, and there's a great quote in it that says, uh, show me how you play and I'll tell you who you are. Right. And it's like, it's, it's pretty much right. Um, yeah, uh, no, I, absolutely. I think I think there are. I think one of the, one of the most interesting things to investigate is this way that like sport works is like this facsimile of life in some way, um, and so many of the traits that one considers to be part of living a good life are also applicable in in sport. And I think. In some in some sense, maybe that's one of the reasons why so many people love to watch this unfold, right? In front of them, right, live, because you're witnessing like acts of uh, of, of like empathy, of bravery, of courage, right, of um, all these things, and, and they're kind of laid on this stage in front of you, and you get this um, emergent script, right? In mm -hmm. some sense, it's like more dramatic than a film or a or a, or a play because it's, it's unscripted, right? And, and and you're watching these different characters and you have the multiplicity of characters you have the hard man right and you have the the tricky fast one and you have the difference again is i love that idea of like there's a you can't have harmony without difference right and it's like you have these different um notes right all playing together and and and, the, and yeah i think that, that there are absolute you can draw these analogies right with with life and i think that's a really yes it's, it's, i think there's lots of validity to it um and then yeah, I suppose I'm always, I just always find myself in between this uh, appreciation of it on that level and then that on the other end of the spectrum, the the almost uh, this this competitive uh, nature of it, mm -hmm. which I like. I'm not, I, I enjoy the competition. Right? I, I've always, enjoyed, I, if I'm playing a, a, a board game, if I'm playing anything, right, I, I don't necessarily want, I don't want to win all the time. It's not really about that. But it's, I want to have a good game, right? Yeah. I don't, I don't want to play with someone who's way better than me, and I don't want to play with someone all the time who's way worse than me, right? I want to us to be relatively right. similar, right? So there's competition, right? And you're testing yourself, and you're testing, and you're, you're, you're hopefully that your opponent is testing themselves as well. We talked about that a little bit earlier as well. So I think that idea of competition and that I think sometimes people mischaracterize competition as this just winner. It's, you have to win. It's like it's not really that. It's an intensity, yeah. right? It's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a being in the moment of intense competition, which I enjoy. I don't know, well, lots of people enjoy that. Yes. Um, and people enjoy watching it because I think you've got, you've got two, David, you, you, you talked about this kind of reciprocal uh, transformation, of, uh, mm -hmm. this idea. Yeah, yeah. You're both you're in the dance, right? It's a good metaphor for it. And you're both moving together. I think that's like a, a thrilling thing to watch. Because, so that's really yeah. interesting, Jamie, because it's, that um, brings out, it seems to me, why there is such a negative view of competition. Because, um, you know, early America was entrepreneurial, was a fair competition. It seemed like it was a fair competition. Mm -hmm. And now when people see competition uh, in the developed world, they see those who have squashing those who have not. So right. they call that competition. Isn't it awful? But that's not really what you're talking about. You said, as you said, yeah. there's no, it's no fun playing with somebody who has got all the advantage. Yeah. You, you, it needs to be, they need to be within a certain range. So competition yes. is good when it brings out the best of the, of both competitors. Right. 
yeah, and, and, and yeah, and I think that's right. So within a range, and it's not necessarily like to do with age or to do with height or to do with anything really, because mm -hmm. people, different, everyone's at different stages of, the, of their right. own development. But it's it's about that. Your it's almost the performance, right? How can can you can you can you do it? it, it you know, are you able to 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 put people in groups where that kind of that 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 style of competition arises because so i think that's that's i mean that's what we need that's it's when things rub up against each other where you get the new thing that that, that emerges right that's you because you go into this kind of nomad this liminal no man's land right between because it's you're both on the very uh, extremes of your ability and like you're pushing 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 and um yeah i think that's like if you as a coach i'm always looking for that right in, in an exercise yeah. It could be individual exercise, it could be competitive, it could be 1v1, 10v10, it doesn't matter, but is there that element of people on the edge of their ability? And that's competition, I think, to me, yeah, rather than this idea of uh, of winning and losing. Sorry, I have uh, I have students waiting for me. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your time, Sue. I think it's yeah, thanks so much. fantastic. Sue, this has been really a pleasure. Big thanks for coming on and also for everything that you're doing with the kids as well. Bless your heart. It was thanks, absolute Sue. pleasure for me. Anytime, kidlets. Thank <laughs> you, Sue. Pleasure. Take care. Bye. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. 